Panel members, how are you? First, let me say happy Pride. So excited to have each and every one of you. Um, and thank you so much for participating. What we're about to discuss today, it can be a very sensitive topic, but it also can be a very educational one for all those out there who want to know a little bit more about the trans community or just want to support the trans community. So really, really appreciate every single one of y'all's time here today. We're going to start with a round of introductions and uh, just in random order, we're going to start with Josh. So Josh, hello. Tell us a little bit about yourself and um, uh, anything that you think might be interesting worth uh, sharing with the world. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Josh. I use they, them, and he, him pronouns. Um, I'm currently in Northeast India, or Iowa, um, working at Luther College in the Center for Intercultural Engagement and Student Success. Um, and my, I was born in Chicago, but I've moved around a little bit um, and happy to be in the Midwest. Josh, what's your favorite thing about Iowa? My favorite thing about Iowa, well, I'm in the Driftless region, so there's lots of like hills and um, like biking areas and stuff like that. So I like to be outdoorsy and do a bunch of that stuff. Awesome. Well, well welcome. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, Sasha, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm Sasha. I go by Hive pronouns. I am a semi-verbal autistic queer trans man, and I'm currently learning how to use AAC, but it's very inaccessible and I'm unemployed and disabled, so it's hard to learn on my own. I'm fortunate that a speech-language pathologist reached out to me and offered to help me for free. So I had my first session last month, and this is actually my first time using my device for something other than filming a TikTok. I've never even used it to have a conversation with my boyfriend, it's so new, so I'm really excited but I'll be switching back and forth between using it and my voice when answering questions for this reason. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I think, I think there's um, such a great intersectionality between intro introducing this and educating people um, about this. And then also I love the fact that you use this a lot for TikTok. I think that that's a, a really great platform to kind of reach and educate individuals. Welcome, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, and then Samantha, do you want to do introduce yourself? Uh, hi, yes. Uh, my name is Samantha. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and they, them. Um, I was born in a U.S. military installation in South Korea, but after moving around a lot throughout my life, I now live in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, and I recently just graduated college with my B.A. in uh, political science and women and gender studies. That's awesome. So two, we have two panel members in Iowa, but started in very different uh, areas of the world, really. What was the, uh, how was that journey from, you know, you, uh, um, from a different part of the world to coming back to the United States? Like, what was that like for you? Um, well, I moved back when I was still a baby. I was five months old when I moved to the United States, but uh, because being a part of a military family, I moved around a lot throughout my childhood mm -hmm. and uh, it sort of like built my own, I built my own sense of identity based on the idea of change and sort of the impermanence of things. Mm. And I think that led to a very unique experience with my own version of transness even. I think that makes a lot of sense. I had the same experience growing up when I was younger. We moved, I think like 12 times from K to 12. And so just kind of uh, being adaptable in that way and kind of expecting that type of change was something I was always very comfortable with. So I, I, I understand that lifestyle. <laughs> Mars, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Mars. I am originally from Arkansas, but I currently live in New York City in Brooklyn. Um, today is kind of a weird day because I had to put my dog down earlier Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm here now and I'm not crying and this is like a nice little, just something nice to focus on that's not my dog for a little bit. So, sure. well, thank you so much. I, I mean, I think our, all of our, our hearts are with you today. That's, it's not easy to lose a family member, obviously. So thank you so much for, for coming and sharing, um, everything you're about to share regarding like your journey itself. Um, and again, much love going out to you, I'm sure for myself and all the panel members. Thank you. Um, we actually have you with our first question answering first, Mars. And our first question is gonna be really centered around the journey of coming out, which is not very easy for any member of the LGBTQI community, but especially I think for a lot of trans 
community members, it can be, there, there are different layers of complexity related to coming out. So um, would love to hear a little bit more about what coming out was like for yourself. Yes, coming out. Um, unlike the movies, I guess, um, it wasn't this big moment or anything like that. Um, it was a more gradual kind of thing. And yeah, I kind of always knew that I was queer and trans since I was a tiny, tiny child. Um, but I, I guess I tend to say that one of the first times I told someone else, like, I am gay, was when I was in my senior year of high, high school and I wrote a love letter to one of my crushes. Um, it was one of the scariest and most brave things I've ever done in my life. And it luckily was it was it was received well. It was not mutual, sadly. Mars um, is like, and it was received well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was okay. It was okay. She was just like, mm, I love you like a sister, kind of thing. Um, but I still did it, and it kind of it it, it still like helped me like come out to my family it was kind of like the stepping stepping stone to that so that was kind of my coming out that's awesome i, I remember um well there were there was nobody out when i was in high school i have a younger brother uh, much younger than myself and i asked him you know were there any um gay couples at prom and this is the great thing about i think the younger generation he was like yeah totally he looked at me like i asked him a really strange question like why wouldn't there be and that's amazing to hear, I feel like, looking back, knowing that like you, there are plenty of high schools where there are gay couples that can be themselves in high school. Like that's a, that, would, that didn't seem like it was possible when I was in high school. So it's really great to kind of hear that. Sasha, do you want to tell us a little bit about your coming out experience? I don't think we can hear um, if you're if you are uh, speaking right now, Sasha. I was 23 when I came out to my partner, my friends, and the internet. I am not sure how well my family understands because I didn't explain it to them entirely. But I was 24 when I told them I am not a girl. Right before I stopped speaking to them. That must have been a very very difficult uh, coming out process then to not only have to come out but then to have to to really kind of potentially lose family members. Yeah. Um, weirdly enough, it like wasn't related to gender. Um, when I discovered I was autistic and disabled a few years ago, they weren't entirely supportive and it basically became such a big issue over a couple of years that it was harmful to my mental health and I had to cut ties, at least until I'm confident and comfortable as a trans autistic person and am able to stand my ground. I have an amazing small chosen family that has supported me endlessly through my transition and I couldn't be more thankful or happy. So it's all fine. That's, that, that's amazing. I, there's the, um, the idea of like chosen family kind of built by the LGBTQI community is something that still warms my heart. And it's something that I'm, I'm I, I tell people all the time. I'm like the, the um, the idea that we have such a unity with people who are not blood related to us, but because we have to be, because we have to find that unity um, is something that can sometimes be unfortunate, but also is such a, an amazing, beautiful thing when you kind of curate that family of yours, which sometimes is, is much more than just having a friend. It's like they're, they're your lifelines emotionally, mentally, intellectually. It's, it's great. So I'm so happy to hear that you have that. Yeah, it's, it's definitely very true. And um, most of them are queer, if not all of them are queer and, you know, they were definitely like uh, foundations to me being able to discover my queerness was because I was friends with them and because they were my chosen family. Yeah. And they probably have gone through very similar experiences that can help you kind of um, relate or build towards your more true self. Yeah, it's very true. That's great. Uh, Samantha, tell us a little bit about your coming up process. Uh, yeah, so sort of my coming out process started when I was in high school around the age of 16. Uh, 
mm. when I came out as bisexual because as just sort of how I thought I felt at the time um, and sort of the gradual process of figuring myself out through uh, various events in my life, such as after I went to college at the age of 18, I realized I was trans and decided to come out to my parents in a very loud and very crowded sushi restaurant in my college town. As one um, does, as one does, yeah. Exactly. If I, if um, I hear that then, story one more time. <laughs> yeah, and then just eventually coming out uh, as a transgender lesbian now at the age of 21, and I've been open about that for the past year as I'm now uh, graduated and moving on past my college years, which acted as a very, like, a time for me to really reflect on who I was and embrace the sort of change that has become part of who I am. That's that's amazing. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. And then Josh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your coming out process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think my coming out process started with my sexuality. Um, I think I kind of knew about it in high school, but I just convinced myself that it was just a very intense um, friend crush. Um, and then when I moved into college, I was like, oh no, it's more than just wanting to be friends with you know women. So I came out as a lesbian then, um, and um, I was comfortable with that identity for a couple of years. And then after a breakup, I cut my hair and it was very short and I liked that style a lot. And then I started dressing more uh, masculinely. And it was through that changing of my gender expression that I realized I wanted to change my physical appearance as well. Um, so I decided that I wanted to start taking testosterone, identified as a trans man um, when I was 22 is when I came out. Um, and then just recently within the last couple of years, I've shifted more towards adopting a non-binary identity. Um, trans masculine is the label that I'm most comfortable with right now. Um, I think at first when I started transitioning, I wanted to embrace the more masculine parts of myself. Um, but then as I started taking testosterone and had top surgery, I felt comfortable going back to the more feminine parts of myself. Um, and so now I feel more authentic, just wanting to not really have a label and just experience my identity and my gender expression in a way that just feels comfortable to me, depending you know, on what day I feel like. If I want to dress more femininely that day or more masculinely, um, it kind of just depends. So that's where I'm at right now. That's uh, amazing. I, 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 I um, relate not to the same degree, but this idea of, you know, we're all we're all changing as people, and being being open to identifying your emotions or where you are emotionally, intellectually, and then um, identifying that and kind of living in that in in that emotion or in that space is really helpful, I think, as, a, as an individual. And especially, I think, as more and more uh, time and energy have been put into supporting LGBTQI community, you know, there have been new, new terminology over the past 10, 20, 30 years that have really helped a lot of us better understand who we are because there's subcategories that even go layers deeper than LGBTQIA. And every time we find even more, you know, uh, smaller subgroups within, it allows individuals like yourself, and I'm sure other people here, to further classify themselves or the option to say like, oh, you know what, that was me once and now I'm in this category or now I feel more like this. But I love the fluid nature or the openness to saying that like, I'm going to change and as and as I change, um, I'm going to be open to just identifying in this way and, you know, really wanting people to support that. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like that's why I kind of gravitated towards just the terminology queer, because I feel like it is just so broad and fluid and you can identify, you know, throughout that label rather than just being stuck in just sort of one term that is supposed to describe you. So, right. All right. Well, thank you all so much for helping, uh, share, well, for sharing your coming out stories. It's not anyone in the LGBTQI community knows that it does not end. It is not something that you say once and then it is over. And in many cases, uh, not just because you meet in new people and you have to um, sometimes let them know if, if you feel like it, but also because many of us here uh, will continue to evolve within the LGBTQI community. And so a lot of times you have to reintroduce yourself because like Josh was just talking about, um, you may find yourself in a different space within our community, which is, which is uh, phenomenal. Our next question is gonna be really focused more so around how the LGBTQIA community and 
the non-LGBTQI community support the trans community. And I, I'd like to start first with uh, Samantha. And Samantha, what I'd love to know from you on a scale of like zero to 10, zero being like really bad and 10 being best case scenario. And we'll start first with the LGBT community. How do you think the LGBTQIA community uh, supports uh, on a scale of zero to 10, the trans community? Um, I would definitely say that out of the sort of zero to 10 scale, I think that uh, from my experience and from my knowledge looking at it objectively, that uh, it's at about a seven or an eight um, mm. because for the vast majority of LGBTQI plus people that I know and that I've communicated with and talked with in the years have been extremely accepting and have been uh, people who like I would gladly, you know, be able to support them and have them support me if I needed it as well. Um, and the only thing that really doesn't make the experience with the community itself a 10 for me was because of a very loud uh, vocal minority of what are called transgender exclusionary radical feminists or TERFs for short, um, who make it so that especially uh, with my experience being as a part of the lesbian community, I think uh, with TERF sort of being sometimes present in those areas, it has made it so that way it makes me feel a little less welcome just because of the anxiety that there may be TERFs within those spaces. Uh, we need to explain what TERF means because it's a relatively new uh, terminology, even for myself who I, you know, I am uh, a queer Latin, and so I'm sure there's plenty out there who are unfamiliar with that terminology. Um, yes, yeah, so really what transgender exclusionary radical feminism is, is sort of the belief that transness is somehow detrimental to the idea of womanhood, uh, whether it's trans men leaving womanhood, uh, or in my case of trans women who are seen as like infiltrators uh, in trying to sort of invade or colonize even women's spaces. Um, and sort of that rationalization of the oppression of trans people through the sort of fake lens of feminism. Got it. Wow. It's, um, it's unfortunate with it, even within the LGBTQI community and those people who consider themselves allies that we have, people that are that... Um, uh, like a difficult to reach and, and difficult to kind of fold into the loving nature that is the broad LGBTQI community. So, so seven is where you would rate the, the the love and support from the internal LGBTQI community with the trans community. That's interesting. Mars, what about you? How would you rate uh, the LGBTQI community? Um, similar to Samantha, um, it will just agree with everything everything uh, that she just said. Um, yeah, I would say a seven internally. Um, so earlier on in my transition, my medical transition, um, I was on the gay hookup apps like Grindr and Scruff um, to meet cis guys and they were not very trans friendly at all, um, at all. And just like didn't understand what trans meant. And if I would say like, I'm a trans guy, they're like, oh, okay. So like, well, maybe it's not the most appropriate thing to repeat anything that I read in sure. my messages, but, <laughs> yeah, sure. but yeah, they didn't understand the difference between trans man, trans woman. Um, at all, but I have been noticing in the last few years that there is some understanding and like I'm, I'm meeting cis guys, gay cis guys who are like, oh yeah, I've been with trans guys before. Like I totally, I, I know how to do it. So <laughs> um, yeah. that's refreshing, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done I think that, that we've come a long way, especially to your point within the past couple of years of giving um, a voice to trans stories by, by 
we are by far from being in a great space. But I've noticed, at least in the arts and entertainment area, there are more trans stories being told, whether they be fictional or non-fictional. I had, I had my, my mom, who's um, a Latin religious uh, woman, reach out to me via Facebook Messenger yesterday and, said, and, and recommend, recommended to me as if she thought I had, had not seen it pose. And regardless of whether or not you think Pose is the, is a, is the, the most accurate uh, depiction of the trans uh, community, the mere fact that my mom is reaching out to me and saying she loves this show, she thinks it's great, and she thinks I'm a little bit of an Electra, um, is just really like uh, um, amusing and, and, and really great. I'm like, my mom somehow found this and loves the show. Um, and I'm wondering if there's that connection to your point about when you're out there on these apps for dating um, or whatever, the you know the idea that more and more people are comfortable or no vernacular or or really just understanding uh you know what what trans is i think is really great josh what about you how would you rate the um lgbtqia community yeah i think um a seven sounds fair to me um i think what I've noticed is I think there has been, you know, an increase in acceptance in the last couple of years. But I think even within the trans community itself, um, there's still folks who are antagonistic to other trans people. Mm -hmm. um, namely, what, what comes to mind for me is those who would identify as trans medicalists or true scum um, who tend to believe that trans people need to medically transition and they need to pass as a cis person in order to be um, valid in their identity. And so they tend to be pretty nasty towards non-binary um, and gender non-conforming trans people. Um, so unfortunately, even within the trans community itself, there's still some folks who you know, aren't very supportive of other trans people, um, which is sad because I feel like we need all the solidarity we can uh, within the trans community and in the broader LGBT community um, to really fight for you know our rights and liberation. Yeah, and it's just, just the layers of complexity. If if we as a um, if we are not a united front as the LGBTQI community, how can we expect non-members to follow along with us if we have our own internal squabbles um, and uh, hang-ups on what a a um, what classifies a man, woman, or you know other that you know that's it's. It's, it's, it's like really frustrating to hear, um, but yeah. Um, Sasha, what about yourself? I am very new to the community, so my opinion reflects that, but I think about a six or seven. I think many LGBTQIA plus people, especially those with less marginalized identities, want to remain the most oppressed and recognizing the trans existence and struggles, namely those of black and brown trans women, would deny them that ability. I also think many others want to support us, but don't realize that it takes actual work to do so, not just simply verbally supporting us, but there is a large swath of cis LGBTQIA plus genuinely educating themselves and supporting us in ways I don't think the trans community has ever seen before. Mm. Yes. Uh amen plus one to that everything that you just said a second ago you know we are in pride month it's funny i've seen more so than ever more people whether they be within the lgbtqi community or outside post more and more about whether or not brands should be involved in the month of pride and it always for me um you know a part of our community comes back to the level of authenticity mm -hmm. and are you doing are you doing more than just like happy pride on june one and then that's it or, right. or like making some like terrible, like not to call out Target, but like some like, you know, you didn't really check with any actual like queer people to make sure that like they were actually gonna buy the merchandise that you like sell for Pride Month. Yeah. Like that kind of thing. Totally. I think it this is like embarrassing. I almost wore that suit. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But no, you're right. I mean, I think I think um there are there are better ways. Uh, and uh, we need more ways than just simply sharing a social media post, not just as brand, but as people, as, as is, is everyone out there, it needs to be more than just like happy pride. It needs to be like um, looking into nonprofits, making donations if you're privileged enough financially to be able to do that. Maybe watching a show, maybe reading a book, et cetera. There are just there are more things to do. And I know we're going to share some of those things and how y'all out there in the world can get involved. Um, but it is a really great point. It's, it's more than just saying for a day or so, like, you know, LGBTQA rights. So thank you for bringing that up. That is 
really important. And I think, again, a message that we'll probably say multiple times is if you're just sharing a social media post that says, I support this community, you are not doing enough. You could be doing more. Now let's flip it and talk about outside of the LGBTQI community. Cause I think y'all all said about like a seven, seven or eight within the community itself, which, you know, I think in retrospect, like that's, that's not, ba that's not bad. There's definitely, we could be better for sure. And we should continue to try to be better, but that's pretty good. And let's talk about outside of our community. Where do we think support lies on a, on a zero to 10 scale? And we'll start back up at the top with Samantha. Um, yeah, so I definitely think that uh, on good days that the support from non-LGBTQIA plus people lies at like a three at most, uh, like, and that may just be because I live in a rural area uh, and that like people in my area are, you know, they don't they aren't exposed to many trans people uh, and that the specifically the governments of our region uh, are very kind of, they're built sort of almost with the explicit exclusion of trans people in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think though on a bad day that leads to with uh, how I feel outside support being at a complete zero uh, because like, obviously I'm, a gender non-conforming trans woman and i think that it even though i am white and i do have that level of privilege from it it still paints a target on my back uh that i face a lot of uh stares and uh people are not exactly they don't treat me really well per se and i think that uh seeing that on days like that it makes me feel like uh, cisgender heterosexual people just don't support trans people at all and like don't care about the struggles that we face. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, uh, there, there are no words to describe. I think the, the feeling of walking into a space and, and you can feel it in the back of your neck when there's, there's judgment or there's somebody who um, without your permission is feeling the need to I classify you. Um, it's a terrible feeling. And um, it's not surprising that I think our, our the, the, the trans community uh, has to deal a, a lot with that. Um, so it's, I hope it continues to get better within the, um, the non-LGBTQIA community because I think we all, all need it. Mars, what's your experience been like with uh, the non-LGBTQIA community? Um, I would also have to give it a three. Um, yeah, I, I personally don't, I don't experience like violence for being seen as like queer or trans or anything. And I am mostly like pass or whatever as male. Um, but a lot of my trans friends are trans women and I hate, I hate the way people like look at us. I mean, I used to, I used to travel in a band, like go on tour across the country and I would be terrified. We would all be terrified when we were traveling through the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Um, no offense to people in the Midwest, but the truck stops are terrifying when there you have like two black people and like three trans people. It's scary, you know, all the stairs. Um, and also scary are the anti-trans bills that are mm. uh, passing very recently. Um, but I, I, I feel like sometimes there is like a glimmer of hope mm. Um, with people like my little brother, I always say he's little, but he's like 29. <laughs> um, he's not a, he's not like a little baby. Um, but yeah, he's a straight cis guy, but you know, he does his research and he doesn't ask me, he doesn't really ask me questions. And like, anytime he feels like he's like messing up, he'll just be like, 
was that okay that I said that or, or whatever, like, he's like doing the work and doing the research on his own. And I feel like that's, that's critical for straight cis people, especially. Um, yeah, and, I, I, and I'm kind of noticing a lot of just like Gen Z folks just being, I don't know, like queer and like, and like supporting and just like being down and like doing the research. I'm a millennial, I'm, a, I'm older than I look. Um, and yeah, I'm just really proud of the younger folks who are, you know, doing the work and supporting queer people. And that, that just goes into like uh, beyond just, you know, sharing the social posts, take time to learn. Like um, everyone's on their own kind of journey in, in many different ways. And if you can even Google search Wikipedia or ask someone like, hey, what would be a great way to get started in, in my learning? That that I think can mean so much to community members. And that's for outside our LGBTQIA men. It's for everyone, even within. I mean, I think again, like our LGBTQIA friends have a lot to learn themselves. Um, so th yeah, you're right. Today's youth seems to be um, a little bit more open-minded to kind of this idea of living your authentic self more so than probably older generations and and taking the, the time to really uh, sometimes learn, uh, which I think is helpful, but I think in other times, just taking the time to say, okay, if that's who you are, great. And, and even that is just like a weight off, I think so many of us are our shoulders, so that's great. Um, Josh, what about you from your experience? Um, yeah, I have to agree about a three. Um, I think that I am very lucky and privileged that I pass in most spaces and I'm able to choose my gender expression in a way that makes me look, uh, I think, you know, like a cis straight white dude. Um, so I think when I am feeling a particularly um, vulnerable, I just um, try to pass as much as I can. And then when I do feel more comfortable, I am able to, um, visual like showcase my queerness um, a bit more um, but unfortunately I think you know with this question I think that the support and knowledge um, only goes so far for some people I think that you know trans people who are privileged enough to be able to afford um, access to medically transition whether it's um, you know by taking estrogen or testosterone or it's with the surgeries they are able to pass more and feel a bit safer but it's for um, you know our low income trans family that I think that they face a lot of barriers and accessibility, um, whether it be, you know, employment, housing, um, healthcare, all of those are really big barriers for them. Even, you know, changing your, you know, license to reflect your actual identity. And whenever you have to show that, you know, you're just outing yourself to people. And it really just depends who you're interacting with if you're able to, you know, get access to housing. If they're transphobic, you're probably going to get denied, right? So, I think in that aspect, especially for lower income trans people, I think that they live a much different reality than someone like me who is privileged enough to, you know, navigate these public spaces in a way that doesn't help myself. I, I think that's very um, thoughtful, and uh, for you, to, you know, for you to take that moment and, and remind yourself that when I'm, when I'm experiencing troubles, what must it be like for someone who doesn't have some of the privileges maybe that I have? Um, and I think that that's. I think it's very sweet and very kind, and I wish more people did things like that. So, Sasha, what about yourself from your perspective? Uh, how do you think that the non I think we are seeing the same ex externally. I think we are seeing the same exact trends, but at a much slower pace. I think mm -hmm. the non community is around a three or four. Overall, the trans community as a whole has made immense strides, but we are now getting into a tricky situation that is being perpetuated mostly by non queer cis people, where our struggles are becoming fetishized and idolized rather than becoming moon, and this isn't what my trans siblings before me have spent lifetimes fighting for, so while yes there is more support, it still isn't enough and it isn't always the right kind. Yeah, it sounds like across the board everyone's around a three or four, which, let's be honest, if this was a grade in grade school, that's a, that's a deep F, that's a bad, that's a bad grade, right? So we could be doing um, a lot better out there. And if you are watching this, so part of that is continuing to watch this, maybe sharing with individuals and having conversations about it, right? I mean, even if you're starting some of the conversations with an open mind, then I think that that's at least starting some type of journey with 
you know, getting a little bit more involved in uh, the trans community, even if it's, again, just education, which is great. So what are some ways from your perspective, Sasha, that you think that people can support the, uh, the trans community? In my opinion, the best way to support trans people, if you are able, is financially, according to a study done by the CDC and written about by the conversation in the 2020 article, transgender Americans are more likely to be unemployed and poor. Transgender individuals are 14% more likely to be living in poverty than cisgender individuals, not to mention, many of us need thousands of dollars worth of gender. Affirming care, many trans people have transition funds and sending them money to reach their goals is the best way to support us. Along with that, or if you cannot afford to financially support us, you can follow us online, befriend us in real life, listen to us and use the info to unlearn your transphobic thoughts and ideas, and uplift our voices and words, especially that of black, brown, and indigenous trans people, who have been the backbone of our movement yet have seen very little of the recognition. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a, is it's a critical point to put out there is um, you know, the the intersectionality is sometimes we forget about that and we think about the the multiple layers of brown and black people who really made huge strides for the larger LGBTQI community and sometimes totally, get the whole community. Yeah, yeah. Even within our own community, like we sometimes forget that like if it wasn't for you know for them really kind of starting a lot of the the movement like we wouldn't have even some of the privileges we have today uh, as, you know, as our community. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have like, I think an interesting perspective that's different from people on this because, you know, obviously um, there are, I believe you mentioned to me once that there is a way that you might be looking for support, right? Like in, in regards to trying to help other, other members of the community get the technology that they need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right now I'm actually working with a friend who he himself is a trans man. And that was kind of how we ended up connecting was we had a lot of similarities there. Um, so I actually had to crowdfund for to be able to purchase this device. And I let them know that because of the platform I have and because I was able to do it for myself, it's something that I would be happy to do for other people. So uh, as of right now, we are crowdfunding to get him a device um, and as well as an app because the device is just an iPad. So as of right now, um, AAC for Friends is basically how you can find it and we'll link it down below as well. Um, the best way to do it is probably through our GoFundMe, which I set up. And yeah, it's basically just going to help him. Uh, he's nonverbal. So it'll help him get access to a device and an app. And of course we'll buy, you know, a strap and everything for him because it just helps being autistic um, and not having to hold things. So yeah, that's something that I'm working on right now. And it's um, really exciting, but also really sad that people with, you know, those type of like the multiply marginalized identities have so much harder time reaching things and getting access to stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, we will absolutely drop something in the comment section or below so that way um, people out there can, you know, consider getting involved. Josh, from your perspective, or what are some additional ways that people can help support the trans community? Yeah, I definitely agree with Sasha. I think materially supporting trans people is one of the most important things that you can do. Um, I think aside from that, um, I think educating yourself and not centering yourself is also really important. Um, I tend to notice that when people are new to um, different pronouns, such as using they, them pronouns for someone that they know, um, when they mess up, I think they tend to center themselves and be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm the worst person. Like, just make it like a really big deal. Um, when in actuality, it's just better to just correct yourself, you know, in the moment and just like move on and not, you know, make it such a big deal because it just makes, you know, an awkward situation. Um, there probably feels like it's calling more attention to it than it needs to. It's like, no, yeah. this, this awkwardness is almost outing me even more Absolutely. in this, you know, in this constant exchange and saying like, sorry, and then starting over. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I do think that practicing, like even by yourself, like just in your own house and just, you know, using someone's pronouns, like, um, on your own and getting familiar with that language is really important. Um, I actually just saw a statistic from the Trev Trevor Project that said that trans and non-binary youth who have their pronouns respected are 50% less likely to attempt suicide. So I think language is extremely important and being able to practice that on your own and making people feel seen and valid um, is a non-material way that you can really support people and 
you know, help them feel their true self. Yeah, not not feel invisible, right? Um, I saw yeah. that uh, yesterday or the day before too, and it was I, um, for me not a part of the trans community. It was shocking and sad, of course, but like shocking. But it it, it shows you that it doesn't take that much to reach someone to make them feel seen and respected. Even something as simple as like make an attempt to get their pronouns right, or, you know, and hopefully just get them right can help, <laughs> you know, save, save lives. Why wouldn't you do that? Right? Right. Absolutely. And then I believe you had um, somebody in particular that was looking for some additional support that we might be able to drop in the comment section. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my friend Miley is a formerly incarcerated black trans woman um, who is raising money for facial feminization surgery. Um, she's trying to raise $20,000 and only has about um, $25 raised so far. So she has a long way to go. Um, and as you can imagine, as a low income black trans person, um, it is hard to find stable employment and housing for her. So um, yeah, I'll we can link the GoFundMe in the comments and anything that any of you are able to contribute would be really greatly appreciated. Thank you, of course. Mars, from your perspective, I know we've already mentioned a lot, but is there anything else, any other ways, uh, you know, people can support the trans community that we haven't already said? Um, I mean, I guess I just want to second everything that's been said already um, and add that, I mean, definitely, definitely money. Money helps. Um, there, and yeah, there's GoFundMe's. Usually people have their Venmo's and their cash apps um, in their bios on Instagram and Twitter and stuff. You were um, working at a nonprofit, right? Yes, I started one called Rebooty, where I receive donated, broken, used computers, and I donate them back out to black and brown, queer and trans people and it's it's very new. We just got a fiscal sponsor, and I think we're gonna put a link to that, to my website for that. And we're also on Instagram and stuff. Um, but yeah, just supporting organizations like what we're doing and because it's super important to for our people that have access to the internet to participate, especially with COVID. You know, so many things are still virtual, and um, yeah, they we need access to the internet to participate in our communities and really just support, like support and like hire black trans people mm -hmm. for art or you know buy their music, their poetry books, and you know there's. We're artists, we're artists too, you know? <laughs> um, it and feels like it platform. should be um, a no duh statement, but hiring uh, members of the trans community allows them to live their life. So because medical, there's such a big medical side um, of, of, of you know being within the trans community, having a job of course allows you to slowly start getting to um, the person that's within you, right? And I, and I think that that's something that can be overlooked. Um, I think hiring, whether it's an artist, well, first of all, paying them, <laughs> not expecting them to do something for free, but also like uh, hiring them, whether it's a, a part-time job or full-time job can really go a long way in helping them live their, their you know, their authentic self. Um, and then last we have Samantha. Samantha, um, I know we've covered a lot, but is there anything else you can think of or any uh, nonprofit or organization that you think is worth mentioning that can help support the trans community? Absolutely. Um, I think, obviously, of course, seconding what everyone else has said. Um, but also, I think that uh, if you have the resources uh, or even the time to um, to donate money to groups like the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, mm. the Trevor Project, and even uh, with any sort of like mutual aid groups, such as like Food Not Bombs, uh, which help a lot of homeless people, which trans people are disproportionately homeless. And I think that uh, that's an increasingly important thing to be aware of as we are seeing the trend go towards another sort of homelessness crisis. Um, 
And I think just in general also, if there's trans candidates running for office in your local state or even federal elections, you can sometimes vote for them because a lot of them in most cases, not speaking of a certain California gubernatorial candidate named Caitlyn Jenner, um, but if, you know, they will try and get in office and help push trans rights forward. And I think that that's an increasingly important thing to think of, as well as, again, the sort of theme that we have today is just read about trans issues and uh, just like try and find trans perspectives on things and learn. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, I, I think I think the learning part is so critical. And I think along the way, as you're learning, you're most likely going to build a connection at the very least understanding. And hopefully that will inspire you to take more action, whether it's thinking about candidates to vote for, whether it's thinking about donating to nonprofits. But again, like we keep coming back to this theme that it's, it's more than just um, watching Pose. I love Pose, it's a great show, but it's more than just watching Pose. It's more than just um, uh, sharing a social media post. It's being a little bit more um, involved um, than that. So I, I really like that point. I couldn't agree more on that. This next question is probably one of my favorite questions uh, that we have here. And it's really centered around the most annoying FAQ that you get, because I'm sure you get anything from like really sad questions you frequently get asked, but also some that in retrospect, perhaps are really funny. Um, so I'd love to just hear from your perspective, like what are some of the annoying questions to people out there, whether they be within the LGBTQA community or outside of it, like it's like these, stop asking these questions. It's either not appropriate or it's outdated or et cetera, et cetera. And Josh, we'll start with uh, yourself. What, what is a, an annoying FAQ that you wish people would stop asking from your perspective? Yeah, I think the one that I get the most is asking um, about surgeries, particularly bottom surgery. Uh, I've had top surgery and I'm pretty open about that. You know, if ever I'm shirtless, it's pretty obvious that I've had top surgery. Um, so I feel like that people, you know, noticing that want to ask if I'm having bottom surgery or if I had it or basically what's going down down there. Um, and unless we're sleeping together or you have a reason to really know, I feel like it's really none of your business and you wouldn't really be asking a cis person like what, you know, their genital situation is. So I just don't really think it's appropriate and I find it quite isn't annoying. That, isn't that crazy? Can you, like, uh, it, you're right in the sense that like, take the question and think about it if you asked another group this, is it appropriate? And if the answer is no, that probably means you shouldn't be asking me this, you know? Like, would you just go around asking a fellow employee or an acquaintance about your point, their genitals? No, you, you wouldn't. So why does it make it any like better to ask me about that? Right, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, Samantha, any annoying FAQs that either you frequently got or you see members of the trans community get that you are like, just please stop? No more with us. I think mine is sort of related to Josh's is I've been asked a not insignificant number of times, uh, how do you have sex? I think that's strange. Uh, I always try to think I want to have some sort of witty comeback to it, but I just every time it makes me so uncomfortable because like sure. I'm, I do not look like a copy of the Kama Sutra. I am... I'm not an instructional guy. <laughs> I am a human person, and how I have sex is none of my business unless if we are about to have sex. Uh, yeah, I mean, are they looking for like a, a Pictionary type diagram? Like, what is what is the what is the what is the point in asking somebody like that? I, 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 I yeah, you're right. Like, there was there needs to be like a zinger that you could work on back just to kind of um, politely and comically read them and or put them uh, in their place or just indicate like, okay, cool, thank you for that question. We're gonna move on now. <laughs> um, Mars, from your perspective, what's a what's a really annoying FAQ that you get? Um, I mean, I'm thinking the same thing, genitals. I'm just like, why are, why are you asking? Are you interested? Like, this is not any of your business, yeah. you know? And also I do other things other than be trans, like you can ask me like, how do I feel today? Or mm -hmm. what are my passions? Not what's underneath my clothes, you know? 
Do people ever ask you about certain celebrities within your community? Because I, I know I, I get a lot, if like somebody's has recently come out as a gay man, I get people who are like, what did you think about so-and-so coming out? Or in the Latin community, I get like, well, what do you think about X, the, the, the new Netflix Selena series? And I'm like, um, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I, I haven't seen it yet. Do, do you get asked like some of those other questions too? Um, Most of the people I know are queer. They probably know not to ask. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't get that question a lot. I do sometimes, or very, I very recently got asked about like what I thought about, did I think, have I thought about having a child? Mm. And I'm like, are we going to have one? Like, why do you need to know this? I don't understand right. why you're asking me this. Right. It's, it's, always, it's always invasive questions, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sasha, what about you from your perspective? What's a, an annoying FAQ that you wish either you would stop getting or you would hear members of the trans community uh, stop yeah. getting? Yeah, um, I'm on TikTok. And I basically, I make like trans and autistic content. So I don't get a lot of weird questions in real life, but boy, are people bold when they're behind a computer screen. Um, a really annoying one for me is why don't I wear a binder or even a bra? Because not every trans masculine person has to have a flat chest. Men have boots too, because I'm autistic. I have severe sensory sensitivities that keep me from wearing a binder, despite wishing I could have having bad talk dysphoria. So it's hurtful to receive that question for multiple reasons for me personally. Could you hear that? I don't know why it switched to my tablet and off of my speaker. No, no troubles. I think I think we got the majority of it, and uh, yeah, I, that's that would be really frustrating, I'm sure, to to uh, get that question or to have people make commentary on it frequently. It is, it is. It's incredibly frustrating, and I actually I'll have more often than not, it's fellow trans masculine and trans men who they themselves wear binders or wear bras, and they feel that like because we're both trans, they can ask me about it. But like truthfully, it's just hurtful. Especially because, like, if I could, I would wear a binder all the time. But I can wear a binder for 30 minutes at most before getting, like, more overwhelmed than most people experience, like, on a regular basis without something horrible happening to them to cause it. So it's just, like, it's it's incredibly hurtful because I would if I could, but I can't. So I won't. And that's yeah, not it, 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 it just reminds you, like, unless you're somebody that's within my... my um, like the friend zone, like you're not you're not here in my world to be able to ask me a question like that. Even if you're part of the LGBTQI community, I don't know you like that, no. right? So like, unless you're my my good Judy, like this isn't necessarily something that um, you should feel comfortable asking me. You know? Yeah, it's very true. Wow, that's um, where I'm running a little bit low on time. And I know that there is a question that I, every one of you is super excited to uh, provide a point of view. So we're going to skip to our final question. Um, and it's centered around um, what does trans liberation look like? And we're going to start with Mars. From your perspective, Mars, what does trans liberation look like to you? Trans liberation to me looks like Black trans women surviving and thriving. Mm -hmm. Uh, first and foremost, um, being able to walk the streets freely and safely, um, owning things, running businesses, having access to medical care um, and being cared for by doctors who respect them. Um, that's the main thing that comes to mind. And, and and incredibly, incredibly important. Yes, great, great response. Samantha, from your perspective, what does trans liberation look like? I think from my perspective, uh, trans liberation is for me looking at the like base institutions that we live in, sort of our government and our economy. And I think that uh, making it so that we live in the material conditions where uh, transphobia and uh, racism, homophobia, sexism, and issues such as homelessness and poverty, I think, cannot exist because those often, the ways in which our base institutions work very much affect the way we think about certain issues. And I think that uh, sort of looking at 
making our government and our economy work for uh, the most like oppressed people in society and have them be able to interact with and be successful in those frameworks, I think is the biggest step towards trans liberation. Yeah, that's great. I, 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 I can't wait to share this section of it and maybe even like um, call out this time because I think this is one of the more critical questions for, you know, it's almost like within this space, I want everyone to watch the entire video, but if you, if you can only catch a snippet of it, like this, this question is truly, I think, uh, a really important one. Sasha, from your perspective, what does trans liberation look like? Trans liberation is being able to exist without surgery or medical transitioning without being questioned. It's not passing and still having your gender respected. It's having free health care that covers trans care. With medical professionals educated in the trans experience, it's being able to exist safely and comfortably as an unemployed disabled trans person. It's trans kids having the opportunities to discover themselves in ways I never got to. It's not assigning a gender to newborns. Yeah, I, with, with the for so many trans community members with the medical part being such a, such a big thing, um, a, a barrier or something that they have to potentially overcome, it's not a surprise at all that healthcare, access to healthcare is super, super critical for sure. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. I think that, that can't be uh, uh, said enough times. Josh, and from your perspective, what does uh, trans liberation look like? Yeah, I'm loving everyone's answers. I definitely agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, just to add on to that, I, I definitely believe that trans liberation has to be based in racial and economic justice. Um, and I think um, additionally to that, I think um, indigenous cultural practices, indigenous land and body sovereignty needs to be respected as well. Um, and I think that um, there also needs to be support for both trans youth and trans elders in a way that I don't think um, exists currently. Um, additionally, I think, you know, bodies and disabilities shouldn't be policed or criminalized um, and that sex work economies have rights and protections as well. Um, there's actually a really great site called the Transgender Law Center. They have a trans agenda for liberation um, that I think touches on what a lot of us have talked about as well. Um, but yeah, I think um, ultimately what I want to get across is that racial and economic justice needs to be centered in transgender liberation. That's great. Thank you so much. We are almost out of time, but I want to give a moment to say any final thoughts before we close on at least today's uh, panel discussion from anyone. Um, um, go ahead, Mark. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for having me and thanks to the other panelists. You guys are really cool and I want to be friends with you all. <laughs> you can do that. We can make that happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I definitely agree. I want to be friends. I want us all to get together and just live our best lives. Um, but um, yeah, thank you so much for having this panel, for letting us speak our truth. Um, and I also just wanted to say real quick, I know that there's been a lot of um, legislation going around specifically about trans people in sports. Um, and I just wanna throw out there that gender in, and sex honestly is a social construct. And I think I don't have the space here to really say all about that, but you can Google it. There are lots of resources out there. Um, Alok Vade Banan has been talking about this a lot. They're a great gender non-conforming activist, um, especially on Instagram. They just have a new book out, but yeah. Gender is a social construct. Um, don't get fooled by our, you know, societal restrictions that we've decided that we need to live in. Um, and I think my piece, um, oh, uh, I think my piece is, uh, I mean, obviously, of course, thank you for having me on this panel, and thank you to the other panelists for participating. Uh, and I think definitely the thing I want to say to y'all in the audience is just listen to trans people and a diverse range of trans people uh, across racial, economic, uh, disability, just all of those vast intersections that make up sort of the human tapestry. Listen to all of us. Sasha, um, I, I think you wanted to say something. Sorry, sorry. Can you hear me now? I kept not you can. on mute. You're sorry. Good. Go for it. ADHD brain. Um, 
I am super thankful that I got to be a part of this. I honestly, we had a few Zoom calls prior to this and I walked away from every single one of them feeling more trans and more beautiful than I have like literally since I came out and it's been almost two years. So I just wanted to say a huge thanks to all of you, but also thank you to everybody who watches this, um, regardless of what your identities are. I think that this was really, really helpful for myself and everybody else who will be watching it. So thank you everybody very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you each and every one of you for joining this panel discussion today. I think I um, am, oh, we, are, oh, we are wrapping up and I am not, I have not cried yet. It's been borderline. Um, you know, education and, and learning and development for each individual, whether you're within the LGBTQI community or outside of it is super important. Obviously it's even more important to, to be actively involved, whether that's from a political perspective, um, uh, learning and development, or even if you have the privilege to financially support. Because the reality is, you look at the, the closing thoughts from every one of these members, and it's about love. The fact that every single one of them just said, really, like, I want to be friends with you, whether they're the panel members or people out there in the world, it just goes to show you that this community, they just want to be connected with you if you let them. And that's, that is, to me, um, a sign of a beautiful community. And, and um, I can only hope that our fellow friends in the LGBTQI community and outside really continue to see that. So thank you so much, panel members. Absolutely love and adore you. We'll continue to drop in some of the um, different sources and links that you talked about, but um, have a happy, happy Pride Month. Really appreciate it.